So we're all getting tired of the pandemic. We're getting tired of the term. We're getting tired of the word COVID. Even I am getting tired of the news. And so one of the purposes of this series of how we grow as Christians is that we need to grow in Christ regardless of the circumstances that we're in. And what we find is we don't automatically grow. Uh, it's something that has to happen intentionally. And it's actually up to us to decide uh, how we're going to grow and how well we're going to grow and how deep we want to go with God. But the point is we can grow in Christ in every season. Um, unlike our gardens that have a season to grow, uh, the season for growth in our Christian lives is all the time. As we turn our Bible, our Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, the letters that uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to young Timothy, he was pastoring one of the early churches in that time. Um, Paul said to him, to dear Timothy, he said, preach the word in season and out of season. And he said, do the work of an evangelist. So if we were going to take that charge up, may we just realize that that's not just from Paul to Timothy, but that from the Holy Spirit to you and I. And so as we look at the season that we're in is a season for growth. And if every season is for growing, we simply say, may we be willing to share the word, not just, you say, well, maybe you think, well, I'm not a preacher, so I can't preach the word. You can share the word, as we can all do. Share the word, and it says, be ready in season and out of season. And he goes on to say, endure hardships. Evangelize and fulfill your ministry. We need to fulfill the ministry that God has given us. In Matthew 16, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church of Jesus Christ will not die. It is designed to grow and it is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it will grow and it has growing and we are involved with the growth because we are in his church. And so may the pandemic or the COVID season not be a despair season. May we not continue in a season of despair for our Lord is still on the throne. He has never left us. As I've said many times, he has not distanced himself from us. Just because there's a virus going around the globe does not mean God has abandoned his church. I want to tell you this morning that the pandemic of sin is far worse than a virus that goes around and affects just the body. And that is what we must be involved with, is with sharing the good news of Jesus. So when we're called to share the gospel, share the news, then we are proclaiming something that is got something to do with getting rid of the pandemic of sin. Rather interesting, last Sunday, listening to Mark Hughes of Church of the Rock, and I, I encourage you who can to listen to uh, Pastor Mark Hughes of Winnipeg. I, I really admire him. I met him once. 
Karen and I were at a Billy Graham School of Evangelism in Edmonton. And um, uh, I'm kind of a fan of his. He's a wonderful preacher. And he said something interesting last Sunday. He said that in their church, and it's true, it's a pretty big church. It's thousands of people. Uh, but he said they added six, at least 600 souls came to Christ in 2020. That's a pretty good evangelistic for, for this country. I mean, it doesn't compare to the day of Pentecost, which we're going to talk about in a minute, but it's a pretty good run for Canada. And so he is excited about those people that came to Christ, and so am I, and so should we all. And so it wasn't a year of, of um, terrible uh, events in their, their church. I don't think it's a terrible year of events for the church in general, because I think we're able to continue on growing in whatever way we can grow. Remember, I get to preach. Nobody's trying to shoot me yet about putting out a sermon. We're freely allowed to come and go to our building, put out this service, the worship, uh, the message, the prayers. We put these out on the airways without any restrictions. I'm also reminding you that anybody who wants to come to the church, up to two of you at a time, can make an appointment with me and can come and we can come and we can pray together and we can counsel together and read the scriptures together. So I encourage you to let me know when you would like to do that and I will meet you here at the church and uh, remind you the church is not actually closed. We're just not doing public service, but we're doing the service. And so I can come and visit. I visit many of you on porch visits or um, distance visiting and then we'll continue that and there's no restriction on that and there's no restriction on being a witness and nobody's told any of anybody that you can't witness for Jesus uh, you will will not be jailed for sharing your faith with someone and I encourage you maybe this is the time to share your faith like no other time Maybe this is a tremendous opportunity that we have as Christian people to share the faith of Jesus Christ that is in us. So we can all continue to be the, uh, the witness and the testimony and testify what God has done in our lives. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, 8, 9, it says, but this is the words of the Apostle Paul. He says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Now the earthen vessels is us, our bodies. That the surpassing greatness of the power, we're all interested in power, greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. It's so important to realize that any power that we get will not be from within us. It will be only from within God that will work through us. He is the God of power. And it is that power that we embrace and that we require. And so, carrying on the next verse, we are afflicted. Sometimes we're probably feeling afflicted right now. We feel hard-pressed. We're afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. We've read that scripture a number of times the last year or two. I think it's a powerful uh, passage. R reminds us that regardless of what circumstances that we come up against, we're not beaten down. We're not destroyed. Now, I think we probably, all of us have experienced some of those things from time to time. We, we probably feel uh, a little bit uh, inflicted. We feel uh, a little bit um, perplexed. But it doesn't mean we're finished. It doesn't mean 
that we need to be in despair, I encourage us to rise up and grab on to the power that God has promised us. They will rise above those circumstances. The, the other day, uh, we had heard about this faith-based movie on Netflix. It's called the, uh, Paul the Apostle of Christ. I would encourage you, if you've got Netflix or some of the way of watching movies, to look that up and, and look for it. It's, a, it's not a, a dramatic drama, but it's a powerful story of the Apostle Paul about the last days of his life in Rome. And you realize the church that was in Rome was really in a dark time. And the Apostle Paul was basically in Rome because he felt God called him there and he went there to take the gospel of our Lord and Savior to, to the very center, you might say, of the world at that time. And he basically was awaiting his execution which eventually happened. But Paul is the one who writes this, and sometimes, you know, I, I know we can be whiners. I, I've been known to be part of the whiners club. <laughs> and um, I don't even drink wine, but we still can whine. But I say to myself, shame on me. I mean, what do I know about affliction? What do I know about being hard-pressed or overwhelmed or persecuted or perplexed? What do I know about that? I've never been whipped for my faith. I've never been put in jail for my faith. I've never been uh, totally uh, hurt and destroyed. And sometimes people have said nasty things about me, but none of those things actually hurt my body. The Apostle Paul went through all kinds of difficulties, and he's the one that says, all these things can happen to us that seem bad, but we're not destroyed. We can carry on. So think about what the Apostle Paul went through in his lifetime which is considerably more than we're ever likely to go through in our, in our lifetime. Going over to 2 Peter, uh, the first chapter of that um, passage, in the first few verses, it starts off by saying that we have received a faith of the same kind as ours, referring to the apostles. We have the same faith that the Apostle Paul had, that Peter had, that John had, that all the heroes of the faith had in the early times of the pre-church and post-church season. We've been given the same faith. And it goes on in a few verses. It says that we have been given the divine power that he has granted to us. And so that belongs to us carrying on he has uh, granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. I love promises if they're a good promise. In order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this very reason also applying all diligent diligence in your faith supply moral excellence and in your moral excellence knowledge and in your knowledge self-control and in your self-control perseverance and in your perseverance godliness and in your godliness brotherly kindness and in your brotherly kindness Christian love. All these things we have been promised. We have been promised faith, but what we need to do is supplement our faith with everything that we know and everything that we have. Supplement the faith, the seed of faith that God has given us. The Bible tells us 
that to every man is given a measure of faith. The faith that you have today in Jesus all began with that little seed of faith at your birth. And you've grown it. You've supplemented. I say, go on, carry on, supplement, and feed your faith. And these things will follow you, will follow. Man, they're magnificent promises. And we enjoy moral excellence. And that turns to knowledge because we're reading the scripture. Self-control and perseverance. And as we preserve in the faith, we become more and more godly. And then that godliness is involved with brotherly kindness and in your brotherly kindness, Christian love. And that's what we've been talking about so much these last weeks about the significance of loving God and loving each other. That is the greatest, two greatest commandments. Jesus himself said, there are no other commandments greater than these. Loving God and loving each other. We can be all involved. I said last week, church doctrine, proper theology is all vitally important. But it all begins with how much we love each other. And if we don't, according to 1 Corinthians 13, if we don't love each other, if we're not filled with love, all accurate doctrines and theological thinking is a waste of time if we don't first have love. So that is the greatest commandment. May we not forget that. Carry on. For these qualities, what I've just read, are yours and are increasing. They render you neither useless nor unfruitful. So, beloved, if you're honoring the scriptures, if you're able to do what I just read, and remember it's first, it's uh, Second Peter, first chapter, go home, I mean, you already are, are home, but after you're finished, read that passage. It's powerful. And we get to put that into our lives, and we get to enjoy the quality. And so, we have the quality of that faith, that belief. It's, you are not useless and you are not unfruitful if you do this. In the true knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, for he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Again, it's a promise and it's extraordinary. So as we talk about perseverance, as we talk about the power from God that is promised to us and given to us, I wanna talk for a few minutes about the Holy Spirit. In the first uh, chapter of Acts, uh, verse 8, these are the, the last words of Jesus that actually is the same. We, when we look at the very last uh, verses of Matthew, the end, last 20, chapter 28 of Matthew speaks about the Great Commission when Jesus gave his final charge. And this is a, a recording of the same thing. So these are the words of Jesus. He says to them, uh, an answer to a question, he says, you, Jesus prophesied what will happen just around the corner. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even the remotest part of the earth. So that is a promise given to the apostles. You will be, and there will be a new power come upon you. And that power is the Holy Spirit. And so we go to Acts 2.38, 2.37 and 38. Now, 
in the, the, the first chapter of Acts, the church had not yet been born. But in the second chapter of Acts, Acts chapter 2, is the day the church was birthed. It was born into history. A brand new era had just begun. The day of Pentecost is the day the church began. And that is the day that the Holy Spirit fell on God's people. And in verse 37 of chapter 2, it says, Now, when they heard this, that's the multitudes, the people from all surrounding areas, different languages and different cultures, there were a lot of people listening. That was quite a convention. And the apostles were teaching and they were preaching. And in particular, Peter apparently seemed to be the kind of the keynote speaker that day. And so when the people heard the sermons, when they heard the teachings, when they heard the words of Peter, they responded to him. And when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, well, brethren, what must we do? They heard the sermon. Now they want to, what must we do to be saved? What must we do to begin a new walk, to be in a new, begin a new chapter? What do we do to be a follower of Christ? Christ has already sent it into heaven. And Peter said to them, Repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been around since ever. Holy Spirit is God. But he never came to dwell in people until this day. The Holy Spirit came upon people through the Old Testament individually. We know that the Spirit of God came on some of the Old Testament heroes. But it still wasn't the same as what happened on the day of Pentecost. Because the Holy Spirit became available to actually dwell in to come and live in the hearts, in the lives of everyone that would receive him. The gift of the Holy Spirit comes upon us at our salvation, and that's the whole thing. Christian baptism had just begun. There was John, John's baptism prior to this. That was not Christian baptism. That was a baptism of repentance. What happened the day of Pentecost was something brand new. And that's when the Holy Spirit came and says, was a gift to man, to live in man. Everyone automatically that came to Christ automatically received the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Romans 8, 9, it says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. It is impossible to be a Christian without having the Holy Spirit in us. It is impossible to get to heaven if the Holy Spirit does not live in us. Part of the package as part of what happened when we're immersed into the church of Jesus Christ. We receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and we get him fully into our lives. However, there's a little bit more to that, perhaps, than, than what we just leave. And it's, it's interesting. I don't believe in a second manifestation of the Holy Spirit. I just believe that we're not always accessing the power of the Holy Spirit. Because in Ephesians chapter 5, we know this verse so well. You know, it might be said, some of you may think, I don't really mind what you think, but you may think, well, I'm looking for this formula or this recipe uh, about how uh, to grow during the pandemic. Well, the Bible's a lot more than a recipe book. It's a lot more than a formula book. You may think though, well, I'm just talking about do's and don'ts. And one may think for a while, well, that's not really very spiritual to think about do's and don'ts. Well, actually it is. 
Because here's what it's here's the do's and don't scripture. Verse 18 of Ephesians 5. It says, Do not, this would be a don't. Do not means don't. Do not get drunk with wine. Oh, really? You know, I've been asked many times in my ministry, in my life, Ian, do, do you think it's wrong to drink? And I say, well, no. There's nothing in Scripture that tells us that it's wrong to drink alcohol. But what's wrong is to get drunk. And it reaffirms right here, do not. So drunkenness is, it goes on to say, is a dissipation. It is something that just disappears, disappears into the, into the air, into the clouds, because it goes into nothingness. So that's what you don't do. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit, referring to God's Holy Spirit. Carrying on, speaking to one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Hey, that's part of the filling. Always giving thanks, part of the filling, for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. So it's important to answer the question, okay, Yes, I suppose we should be filled with the Holy Spirit. What's the difference between being filled with the Holy Spirit and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.38, uh, Acts chapter 2, when, when we actually came to faith in Christ? Well, first of all, it's important to realize that we can. Listen to this. I think this is profound. We can be so yielded to the Holy Spirit that he can possess us completely. Filled implies freedom to occupy every part of our lives, guiding and controlling us. Yes, controlling us. Oh, we sometimes don't like that word. We don't like to be controlled by anyone. We, I say, people. I've heard this most of my life. I don't want anyone controlling me. Well, you know, if we're going to be a follower of Christ, his spirit, his spirit has to control us. And that's what, it, that's what it's about because something's controlling you. Some people may say, I just want to enjoy my life and be drunk half my life. Well, guess who's controlling your life? Something is controlling your life and it's not God. Sin hinders the filling, and obedience to him is how the filling is maintained. So how do we get filled with the Holy Spirit? I see it kind of this way. Imagine your bank account. Then imagine that you have a lot more money in your bank account than what you actually have. Most people would like to have more money in their bank account. If I was to ask you, how much money would you like to have in your bank account, what would you say? It depends who I'm talking to. I, I'm sure every one of us would well, I want, I want at least $10 million, or maybe $100 million, or many millions of dollars. But imagine if you had a bank account that was filled and was being filled regularly with money. And so you go up to the bank. I mean, this tr applies whether you've got a thousand in the bank or you've got 10,000 in the bank, but th this applies to every one of us. We go to the teller and how do you access your money? Do you go into the bank and say, oh, please, could, do you think you would be able to get me some of the money out of my bank account, please, Mr. or Mrs. Teller. I'll sign, but I just, would you mind? I just, please, could you find a way of getting my money out? Do you ever do that? Listen, it's already your money. It belongs 
to you. It's yours, and there's no shortage of it. All you're doing is say, you ask nicely. I would like to take $10,000 of the bank, or th whatever you want to take out, and you take the money out, and then you have the cash, and you have access to your bank account that you can do things with your money. I see being filled with the Holy Spirit kind of like that. We already have it. Our bank account is filled. Our lives already has the Holy Spirit. We received it at our conversion. It's in our lives. All we have to do is ask for it. Now, it's interesting. Sometimes we may forget that the Holy Spirit is God. You know, when we come to Christ, we know there's the sinner's prayer. That goes along with the conversion. And we say, Dear Lord Jesus, please come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. And in Acts 2.38, we're baptized into the faith in the name of the Father and the Son and also the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Holy Spirit is God. And if Jesus can hear us, we invite him into our heart. Guess who else can hear us? Guess who else we can pray for? So we say, Holy Spirit, please fill me with your presence. Do you think he can't come and do that? We have faith that Jesus will come into our life and live in our hearts. When I was a little boy, I remember that, kneeling by my bed with my mom. I believed that with all my heart that Jesus heard me and he came to live in my heart. The Holy Spirit will come if you ask him. He's in your heart, but you just have to ask him that you could enjoy the resources that you already have. Does that make sense to you? The resources are there. The bank account is full. You just have to go and ask him. And so... My charge to us today is, how do we ask him, access the funds in our account, embrace him? He's already living in you. And so you just talk to him. And sometimes we forget just to pray to the Holy Spirit. Remember, that's our power source. If we get short on power, it's because we're not accessing the power. We get short on wealth, we're not accessing the wealth, you might say. Put into practice what you heard these last seven weeks. Put into practice what you already know about the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Obey, practice these things and obey his words and remember John 15, abide in him and he will fill you. I'll leave you with four quick principles. Perhaps, it, perhaps John can put these on later so that it'll be on the, on the video. These are four simple principles and all kinds of other things evolve out of these four. But most of us can remember four things. You could write them down if you have a pen at home there. So the first principle is what to do so that we may grow during the pandemic, but grow anytime because we're called to grow. Well, daily Bible reading. Believers in Christ cannot grow if we don't daily read the Word of God. Pretty well everybody I know eats, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six times a day. And we do that because we're hungry and we like nourishment. And if we went for months or even weeks without any food at all, um, we're not going to be strong. We're not going to be growing. And pretty soon we'll be dying. Daily food is important. Daily Bible reading is vital for your Christian growth. The next one is daily prayer. We need to have communication with God. We need to talk to Him. And our prayers include meditation and worship. Worship Him. Put on some music. Go to him and tell the Lord you adore him and that you love him. The third one is service for him, serving God, which includes serving people. Service gets us involved with other people. It gets our mind off ourselves, and we are able 
to get more outside of herself, less about herself and more about others, because the scriptures talk about making other people more important than yourself. When we do that, we actually forget our problems and we get involved with helping someone else. I believe the greatest way to get encouraged is to encourage others. And the last one is be involved with other Christians the best way you can. A little hard right now, but you all have phones. You do have the ability to visit carefully, distancing. And so I encourage you to do that. And if you do these things, you will grow. May God bless you through this week. May God bless you through the rest of the pandemic and through the rest of your Christian life. God bless you.
pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the past week. Thank you for the safety you've given us. Lord, we continue to seek your blessings, your protection, your prosperity upon our lives. We ask, O oh God, that you would be with those who are not well, who are sick and suffering around the world, actually. And Lord, that you would send people to encourage those who need encouragement. And Lord, then right now we think of the people in our valley. We pray you'll bless them and you would encourage us to help them. May we grow in you, Father, as we have been examining ways to grow in Christ. Lord God, may we grow like you've called us to grow. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you. I love to you today.